Hey everyone, welcome to our uh, Interaction Networks meeting uh, for this week. There's a couple things I want to go over. First off, thank you, uh, Brandon Kelly, for being here. I'm going to go over a couple things. I'm not going to do a whole lot on IP subnetting today, but I do want to talk about IPv6 subnetting. Now, the beauty of this is it is about 10,000 times simpler than IPv4 subnetting. Um, remember that IPv6 addresses are 128-bit addresses. They consist of a network portion that's 64 bits and a host portion that is 64 bits. Okay, so this entire portion here is the network portion and then of course we have the host portion there to the right. What is going to be done and what is being suggested is that your internet service provider is going to give you 48 bits, okay? And that's going to be uh, from your regional uh, registry. And, and honestly, this is even the recommendation for homes, okay? So that leaves 16 bits that you can use to make subnets. Now, what is 2 to the 16? Somebody do that for me real quick. It's 2 to the 16th power. Oh, 2 to the 16th power? Yep. Uh, 16 bits. Do what? 1024. That's more than that. <laughs> it's more than 1024 because it's 2 to the 16th power. Oh, oh, uh, 65, uh, 65, uh, 5, 6, 2. Yeah, 36, 32. Oh, so, okay, yeah. <laughs> Very close, right? <laughs> I'm just, I, I can't remember if it's 32 or 36. I got problem calculated. <laughs> Anybody else get it? Two. Yeah, six, 65, 563, right? 36. 65, 536. 65, 5, 36. Yeah, 655. Yeah. Five. Sorry, I don't have a race on this one. Okay. 536. All right, so here's how it works at your house. If the registry gives you a slash 48, you've got 65,536 subnets at your house of 2 to the 64 hosts. Now think about that. That's a whole bunch of hosts and a whole bunch of subnets. The thing is, when you do this, you're going to see that you've got a massive number of subnets and each one of those subnets consists of an unbelievable number of hosts. Now, will this actually be what is rolled out? I don't know, but just imagine that at your house. This has some serious security implications because right now there is technically, well, there is NAT for IPv6, but we, it's really something that's not suggested. So the hope is that devices on networks will actually have a true global routable address. Right now, one of the things that happens is you have port scanners, right? Yep. But imagine if you have 65,536 subnets of 2 to the 64 hosts, and you just pick one of those subnets in the middle, okay, and you say, hmm, let's, uh, oh, let me do this, and you say, Okay, so 2 to the 64 is 1.84 or something e to the 19th power. So it's, it's a huge number of hosts. Just think about a scanner that sits there and just tries to scan all the hosts on those subnets. Now, right now it would be difficult to do this. When we all have quantum computers, it may not be such a big deal. But you do have an enormous number of addresses that are going to be used. Here's the beauty of it. Subnetting is literally this. In other words, when you look at this, you're going to have the subnets just like this. Subnet 0, subnet 1, subnet 2, all the way down to uh, D, F, and then you could go to 0010. Zero, zero, zero. In other words, you've got 65,536 subnets in that 16-bit, and we'll call them hex steps, 
Okay, that's what that's an unofficial term for each one of these. Each one's a hex stat. Okay, so you've got one whole hex stat or 16 bits, and that's all you have to do to sum that. Here's one thing that'd be confusing sometimes. Uh, imagine if someone says you sum that a. That is literally this subnet right here. Because remember, subnet A is subnet A equals what in hex? Oh, Christ, I couldn't tell. Zero, yeah. one, zero, zero, one, one, zero. Which is 10 in decimal, right? Yeah. A is 10. B is 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 is that, which is all ones. So you're right, it was zero one zero one. Oh no, zero one one zero. Five one zero. Yeah, that's correct. Zero one one zero. But in that bit position. But notice if I say you sum that A, you literally use sum that A. There's a reason I'm telling you that, so just be aware. Okay. But that's it. That's all you have to do to sum that IPv6. There's no crazy stuff like we do. Now look at this. Okay, here's your number right here. Each individual subnet supports 18 quintillion hosts per subnet. Now imagine trying to scan all 65,000 ports, or even let's just say the common ports. Let's, let's scan 20 ports per machine of 18 quintillion hosts per 65,536 subnets. As long as you don't just use subnet zero on your network and give your host the first couple IP addresses, you're going to be good. In fact, if we can figure out a way to make it pull randomly in those 65, 536, and then randomly grab itself an IP address inside of the actual uh, network, then you, port scanning is going to be very, very difficult to do. Will it be impossible? Of course not. You know, what I'm going to do if I'm smart is I'm going to set up a system to where when you connect with IPv6, I know that's a live IP address, and then I immediately come back and scan that. But, you know, uh, just basic scans will be much more difficult to do until we end up with uh, machines that are quantum machines that are much faster than what we have now. Folks, that's it for subnetting IPv6. It is literally that simple. Questions? So they're going to give you this here. You look at this different network. You need one. To, first off, how many networks do you need for this example? How many different subnets would you need for this network right here? Four. Okay, you said four. There's one here. I agree with that. There's one here. There's one here. I guess five if you're going to have one for the routers. Right. You got to have one right here too. So you actually, oh, okay. need, you actually need five. We're going to need five different networks. All right. So we'll go back in here and we look. We've got this block of addresses, ACAD, 2001-0-DB8, ACAD, colon, colon, slash 48. So our register gave us a slash 48. You can pull literally the first five subnets out of here. And boom, there you go. One, two, four, five, and put three there. Now, here's the crazy thing. You thought you were wasting IP addresses before. Look at this. You've got, you know, 18 quintillion addresses and you're using two of them. Now, you can actually shut that on down if you want to, but that is actually not something they're suggesting that you do. Um, they're right now just saying waste those addresses. I mean, technically, there's enough in the address space to give uh, every single grain of sand on the planet an IP address, an IPv6 address. So they're not worried about waste. Of course, when the nanobots need their IP addresses, it'll be a different story. They'll change it. And in here, of course, we're putting IP addresses on the interfaces. And they will be slash 64s because it is using 1, 2, and 3. And that's, that's how simple it is. I wish it was this simple with IPv6 or IPv4. Are there any questions on that? No questions at all. Uh, I can't think of anything for that one. No all, see all, hear all. I mean, what? I mean, what are they really testing on for IPv6 anyway? 
Big, big things will be, can you, uh, do you know how to shorten an IPv6 address? How many bits on an IPv6 address? Possibly putting things onto a, uh, onto an interface. Um, you know, most of it's just knowledge of how IPv6 works, not necessarily uh, configuration, but configuration is becoming more uh, as we move along. So, that's the big thing. Good question, question. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, even accessing the IPv6 internet, like for Google or anyone right. else, it's like you're still VPNing. The right now, because most uh, most vendors are not running IPv6 to your home devices. By the way, if I was trying to hack stuff right now, I'd be doing it with IPv6. That'd be what I'd be trying, because everyone has IPv6 enabled, and no one is really looking at it. They don't even realize it's enabled, and it's running around on the network. Um, quick question. Tell me the seven layers of the OSI model. Oh, okay. Layer seven to layer one. Let's start with layer seven. Oh, you, want, you want from top to uh, seven is your application. Okay, I'm just going to put an app because I'm lazy. Okay. All right. Yep. You got application. You've got your um, presentation. You've got okay. the system layer. And, and then we get to the real networking, which is going to be your transport. And then you got your network, then you got data link, and then you have your physical wire. Okay, transport, network. All right, bonus for anybody that can give me the two sub layers of the data link layer. All right, the, the what now? The two sub layers of the data link layer. LLC and. Uh, LLC and what, Kelly? MAC. And MAC, yep, LLC and MAC, Logical Link Control and Media Access Control. What we have talked about in this class so far is we have talked about how things are bits, okay, so we've got bits. Bits are encapsulated, um, well, as you come from the top, they're encapsulated top down, but then we have what at layer two, what's it called there? Bits, Frame. what are we called a protocol data unit at this layer, so what's a PDU? Protocol data unit or the name of the information at that layer. Frame. Layer two deals with frame, framing, frame. right? Get up frames. Yep. How about the network layer? Uh, packet. Packet or sometimes it's called other things. Bit frames, packets. What is it called at layer four? Well, that, that's transport. That's network layer and, and PDU, right? That's your layer three. Uh, no, no, layer three is this one right here. It's a packet. Layer three to packet. Yeah, layer four. Layer four. Uh, so far, so it's this. Layer so, one yeah, is a bit. That's, that's like your um your your it's your actual um control. There we go. Control for uh what you're going well, what's to. What's the name of the PDU? Isn't it control? Nope. Datagrams. Bits, frames, packets, datagrams. Uh, okay. Or that segments. Hold on. Yeah, oh, that that's segments. segments. Yeah. Packets or datagrams here. There we go. Okay. So bits, frames, packets, or datagrams. And then up here, we just kind of lump it into. It can be called a packet, it can be called app data, you know, basically it's available later, okay? So bits, frames, datagrams, segments, Segment. or packets. You can do either one, packets, datagrams, you see both, okay? Now, okay, here's the what we're just, I thought control fell into PDU, so maybe that's what I'm thinking for segment. Uh, yeah, segment control. I've never seen control named a, a PDU named control. Now, okay. that's, that's I mean, that's true. Been, that's... I'm not saying that it hadn't been. I was just trying to think of where I kept remembering control from for, because I was thinking segment got broke down because it's either TCP, UDP, and that was the control breakdown for how it was actually putting the bits on the wire precise. 
Okay, I made a mistake here. This is data possible. It's segments or datagrams here. But segments are what we typically call them there, layer at layer uh, four. So segment for TCP and a datagram for UDP. So this is what we call it for TCP. This is what we call it for UDP. And there's, uh, let me put this in there. Wah, there you go. Well, I'm so this is where I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah, I bet mean, that's where you're getting from. Okay. Here's why this is all important, though. What we've learned so far is imagine we have a server sitting here. Okay, so this is a happy server. We've got a happy little PC over here. This PC is connected to a switch. Okay. This switch connected to the server. And this server is running a web server, and that should have been a W, but it ended up looking like a crazy whatever. And it's also running an FTP server. All right. Now, let's go ahead and get my IP address. So this is 192.168.12.10 slash 24. This is 192.168.12.10. Slash 24. All right. Now, when this happy little PCA, and I'm going to call it PCA, wants to contact the server, and it wants to access the web server, what is the first thing PCA is going to do? DNS query. Okay. Well, that's that's what it's going to do first is do a DNS query to see to find. The IP address. So if this was www.acme.com, and hopefully that's not something that's actually uh, trademarked, it would do a DNS query, and there'd be some other stuff that went on because it had to go out to your DNS server and all this. But it's going to come up with the IP address, which is 192.168.12.100. Once it has the IP address, what's the next thing it's going to do? Well, it's going to realize it's on the same network. Okay. But will it do that? Okay, let's say it does that, but it's got to do something else even before that. What's it going to do? Up. ARP request. Right. request. It's going to send out an ARP request and say, hey, who has this IP address? The server will respond. At this point, this PC can now do the data link portion of the, of the information, right? So it now knows the framing information. And what else does it know? Because it did DNS, it has the IP info, correct? Mm -hmm. So now PCA can create a packet. In other words, it's going to take the application data, whatever that happened to be. It could be a GET request for the web page or whatever, and it's going to put that, it's going to put on the front at the IP or network player. It's going to do the uh, source. Let me get rid of that real quick. It's going to do the source IP. And it's going to put in the destination IP, right? Yep. And then that becomes data at layer two. Okay. And so there's a CRC added on the end. And then on this, now there's other stuff in here, obviously, but the destination MAC. MAC. Yeah, the destination MAC address and the source MAC address goes into that frame header. And then that gets sent from the PC. Okay. Goes from the PC over here to the switch. Switch does a lookup of the Mac, and let's say the switch already has it in this table. And then sends it over here, right? Now, the one thing we have not put in here yet is what is the layer four information? What is the transport layer information? Because uh -huh. even above the IP, we need to know what app it came from, right? Well, that is this. That's this data that's inside of here. And what you would have at layer four is you're going to have the data that is from the application layer. But you're also going to have a header. And it's going to say what the protocol is. And it's going to have port information. And it's going to have two types of ports. There's going to be a layer four source port, 
and a layer four destination port. Now, what would be the source port for this communication? Between port 80 for the web, for uh, HTTP traffic. Well, not the source port. Remember, it's going from the PC over to the server. So the destination port is, in fact, TCP 80. But what is the oh, source oh, port? Uh, the ephemeral port of the machine. Correct. So what, it's some random number above 1024. All right. So let's say TCP 2000. Do you agree with me? That'd be fine. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. All right. When that is received at this server, at the happy little server here, it looks at it and says, well, hey, guess what? That is my destination MAC address. Okay, cool. Take that off, run the CRC, everything's good. Passes it up. Yep, that's my IP address in the destination. Didn't mean to erase that. In the destination, okay, good. Once it's got that, then it's got to make a decision. And it says, how do I pass this? Or where do I pass this? What application do I pass it to? And that is based upon this information right here. Okay? So the protocol and port is used to say, oh, you're wanting to go to my web server because you're going to port 80. It would pass it up to www. And then if it was a GET request or whatever it happens to be, the web server can then respond to that request. The transport layer is extremely important for several reasons. First off, it does deal with all the transport layer functions of segmentation, uh, window sizing, retransmissions, and all that if you're using TCP. And it handles all the other things with diagrams that are UDP. But it's also extremely important because you've got to understand, this server is listening on TCP 80 and it's listening on TCP 21. Now remember, there's also another port used for FTP called 20. That's for, it's 20, 20 and 21. 20 is data, 21 is control, okay? If you're uh, using full TCP and not the, it's called sessionless TCP. Um, but transport information is what allows us to run multiple different applications on a server and keep up with those communications between different PCs. Because guess what? Right here, maybe PCB wants to access the FTP server instead of the web server. So it sends an information off. Or maybe PCA is running two different applications. It's running a web client and an FTP client. And it wants to connect. Well, guess what it would do? It would just create a different layer for uh, communication that would go instead of the TCP 80, it'd go to TCP 21, and it would be from a different port. And that's how the server could keep up with two different communications from, from PCA. One would be from 2000 to port 80, the other would be from 3001 to 21. And so you can have two separate streams of communication going on between PCA and the server. And all of that is accomplished because, that should be key. CP, because you've got layer four ports that allow you to do that. Now, I'm drawing a blank. I, again, I call it a hit back moment, but there is a name for a port and protocol that is listening. Can y'all remember what that is? And I'm digging right here. I'm digging hard. I'm trying to find it in the back of my brain, but mm, it's in the curriculum. I apologize. It's what now? Uh, uh, the name given to a listening port and protocol. It's a uh, Well, I, I got it. And like I said, it's there. It's just, it's skipping away from me. Let's see if we can find it in here. All right, so again, the transport layer, we're looking at this, how it creates that. By the way, any of you ever touched a TCP port before? I hope not, because mm -hmm. you can't do it. Yeah. Okay. What I'm trying to say here is realize, any, once you get above the data link layer, everything is software. Everything is, is ephemeral, like you said. 
Here we look at multiplexing, the ability of one machine to have multiple pages open. If you look at my machine in my office, there's probably 15 different windows open at one time. Um, Are you talking about screen say, control? No, it's not screen control. Um, the port control. No, it's so not that either. Uh, there's an application you can turn off the some port. You say you know you can change right. the port, or assign the port. TC have this application. I got it. It's a socket. Woohoo! Socket. Cool yeah, idea. socket. Yes, yeah, it. socket. That's a. Yeah. So when you're socket. listening on a port, like if you're listening on a port, that's a socket. I got port it. Socket. Yep, it's a socket. So it's basically a protocol and a port that you're listening on. Man, I knew I'd get it somewhere. <laughs> I haven't heard that term. The older you get, the harder it is to pull that out from the back of your mind like that. I was going to say, I haven't ran across socket in a long, long, long time. Lee, <laughs> I, 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 I can remember that like back in the old Telnet days, like dial up. Hey, 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 easy now. You, 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 you're dating me a little bit. <laughs> I know, man. I'm thinking AT and T World Net. I, I, like, I, may, I may or may not have used a 24 ball modem. <laughs> I had an X2 modem. I was like one of the five people that bought one. Oh lord! Here we look. Uh, obviously, here's something I find hilarious. People say the transport label layer provides guaranteed reliable delivery, and then of course it has TCP, which does that. But we also have UDP, which does not. UDP is used for things that do not need reliable delivery, or they do their reliability at the layer above the transport layer. Be aware that the reason that TCP and UDP both point to DNS is because DNS uh, information between two servers that uses TCP, but DNS queries between a client and a DNS server uh, use UDP. So, uh, again, TCP, it does many different things, but one of the biggest ones is the fact that because it requires you to do a three-way handshake before you start sending data, it's going to ensure that the information or at least a path is available. It also does things like taking segments and giving numbers or um, segment identifiers to them so that information can be put back together in the correct order when it's received and also acknowledging received data. So if it's not received, you can retransmit it. UDP is uh, TCP's unreliable little brother. It basically says, hey, I'll get it there if I can. If it doesn't get there, hmm, I don't care. Um, if you need uh, any type of guarantee of data with UDP, it has to be done at the application layer. So the application itself has to do it. Um, most times, though, UDP is used for things that you really, there's no need to, to to retransmit. For instance, if you're doing voice over IP and you try to retransmit a missing couple packets, it would sound like, um, who knows what it would sound like. It might sound the way Brandon, we sounded earlier when we connected, how you had a 10 second delay. Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. So the right, uh, right transport layer protocol for the application, UDP is fast, low overhead. If you uh, look up the RFCs for UDP and TCP, you'll see how small the TCP, UDP header is compared to the TCP header. Uh, but UDP doesn't resend data and it just delivers it as it arrives, whereas TCP tries to deliver it at least in a somewhat sequenced order and then has it, if it does arrive out of order, has sequence numbers so it can be put back together in the correct order. So uh, what I want to do is just real quick, we're talking about again, um, session control, flow control. I think y'all pretty, pretty well know how TCP works. Here's the header. You're looking at source port, destination port, just like I showed you earlier, sequence number, acknowledgement numbers, how much you have to uh, receive before you acknowledge, header length, reserve control bits, the window, the size. This also is, this is usually the acknowledgement number so that you know how much you can receive before you have to get an acknowledgement. Check some, and then there is an urge push. There are several different fields that you can put into a TCP header, not just urge, but there's, there's six of them. Urge the, the flags, which are control flags, urge, push, um, send, act, reset. Oh, oh and crap. That's what I had hung in my head. The control what? for um, quality of service and stuff. Yeah. yeah. That's actually, and that's actually, isn't that in the. That's in the frame. You're talking about D, DCSP, differentiated, uh, DSCP, differentiated services control points. 
This yeah, sir, this sir, that's what I was saying about when we were talking about the PDU. Yeah, uh, this serves yeah, the field in, the, uh, in a frame. Yeah. yeah, this this serves way down in the framing. That's where I had that stuck in my head. Yeah, but that is for a quality of service on for this serve. So again, oh 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 oh, oh drop the pin. I get I don't know. take a look here again at the TCP header at how uh, how big it is, and then take a peek at the UDP header and you can see how much simpler it is. Okay. Uh, I've already talked about this, how multiple conversations are separated by ports, source port, destination ports, socket pairs. I guess we went in here, I remembered sockets, but here's socket pairs. So it's the port and the destiny, uh, the source port and protocol, the destination port protocol. So the socket on the web server is this right here, 192.168.17 colon 80. So, and if you put oh, the old server socket, baby. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Windows 3.1. <laughs> Old school. <laughs> yep. Shut that wind socket. So one of the things I teach students is you don't have to remember all the ports, but it's really good to know some of these. But, you know, they tell you about the well-known ports. It's a good thing to learn most of these. So 2021, 22 for SSH. Um, 80. Oh, man, I was trying to see 23 for FTP when... Yeah. yeah. And then 25, um, one that, let's see, is it 514 UDP that Syslog? That's one that a lot of times I have people remember because Syslog server sometimes, I've seen it where Syslog wouldn't start and it's because another server is already running on 514 doing Syslog. So. Yeah, yes, one. it is because I've got, I've got a server set up for, um, I've got a Fedora server set up for my Syslog. For Syslog stuff, yeah. 514 UDP, that's a good one to kind of throw in the memory too. But these are good to know um, for your students and for you. NetStat shows you all the uh, sockets that are listening or all the things listening on your machine, hopefully. Uh, if a hacker's smart, then they'll rewrite NetStat so it doesn't show their stuff. Uh, they just do a root kit, it's all good. Yeah, then you don't have a clue at all. <laughs> So um, here's one thing I do want to talk about this uh, three-way handshake. All of you probably know this already, but you have a send that gets sent. And the way I to tell my students this is, hey, you pick up the phone, call your buddy or buddy, and say, hey, I'm going to come over. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. It's cool. Come on over. All right, I'm on the way. And at that point, you know that if you send something from A to B, it should get there. Okay. Now, these sequence numbers will then be used to start the process with windowing and with the diagrams, uh, the segments being sent and all those things. But this three-way handshake ensures that, are you there? Yep, I'm here and I can hear you. All right, cool. And you do that by looking at the sequence numbers. So you notice you act or B act the 100 sequence to 101, and that lets A know that B saw it. And then when A increments in its act, uh, the sequence number for B, B now knows that it sees it, that A sees B. And then you can initiate communication and everything's good. Now, the bad thing is this is some overhead because you have to go through this process every time you establish a TCP communication. And the really bad thing is, is you can't block TCP, so you can send SENAC and drop and hit the next IP. Yep, and uh, you can just start. <laughs> You can also take SIN and one, you know, SIN, one of them, the way that hackers have done this before is they send a SIN flood, and that SIN flood is from a bunch of spooked addresses. Mm -hmm. And then B has to send back all these SIN acts, and it fills up what's called a half open queue. There's a half open queue for, for SIN. And if that fills up, then B can't receive any more information or can't receive any more TCP and it's unable to communicate. Now, they route modern routers and, and modern firewalls now have a way of, of helping with this problem. They actually will send, a, uh, send a, uh, an act back in the place of an external host. Um, yeah, it, it counts the uh, timeout or something. I, yeah. I remember we, we did a configuration for LFIT for uh, trying to stop like an in-map flood. Yeah. 
And that is, you can actually stop them with modern firewalls now. So it's not as big a deal as it used to be, but it still can be a big deal. Um, here's a good thing, too. TCP not only has the ability to do a three-way handshake at the beginning of a communication, but they also can end the communication. So you can send the FIN and get an ACK, and then the FIN both ways, and basically you're breaking down the communication channel. You're saying, all right, we're done, I'm done. You know, you close your browser out, and you're basically now opening that, uh, that session that's being held in the, uh, in the server's information, you're dropping that because you're saying I'm no longer uh, accessing this information. If for some reason you just don't send anything, it will eventually also time out, uh, but this is a clean way to do it. So here's our control bits. You look at urge, act, push, reset, send, and thin. Uh, there's also, uh, if you do NMAP, there's a way to do what's called a Christmas tree scan where you turn all of these on and it can cause um, machines to send you information about what they have running on them. It's also very easy to catch because it lights up the, the IDS as like a fire, firework show. And folks, that's basically, I mean, we look at reliability and everything, that's basically what the transport layer does other than this flow control when we get into looking at Windows size. This was a big problem when Windows 7 first came out. Um, they had set the initial window size to be way too small, and as a result, when you were on the Internet, especially on faster connections, it was slowing you down. And so way back in the old days, we had to go in and actually make a registry change to Windows 7, maybe Windows 95, but I think it was Windows 7. And, uh, that was, that was Vista. That was Vista. Vista. Okay. Yep. We had to make change that initial window size so it would be faster on the Internet. Um, but basically what it comes down to is send a window size of 10,000, and then when it receives 10,000 bytes, it will then act it, and then it will just keep sending. Now, the good thing about this window size is the window size can shrink or grow depending upon um, the connection between the two, uh, up to a max size, but you can continue to grow it, uh, and then if you start seeing uh, errors or issues, lost, pack, uh, lost segments, then you can bring that window size back down. And so it's, it's kind of... It's neat because it allows for flow control between two devices using TCP. UDP has none of this. UDP just says, forget it, I'm good. Um, here we see again congestion control. If you send one segment and then two and three don't get there, and four gets there, you acknowledge, hey, I didn't get, I got segment one, I get segment two, and it's going to start resending notes. Um, and it's, without TCP, the internet wouldn't work, basically. So here we have, it doesn't matter, they're out of order. They're not reordered unless it's done by the application layer and with UDP. UDP just sends it there and hopes it gets there. It's not necessarily a terrible thing because there are some apps that it's not that big a deal. Um, the client DNS, client radiuses are on port 1812. Uh, that's something if you take season eight security, you'll need to know. Also, radius uses UDP and TACUS uses um, TCP. So here we see UDP requests being made. Yeah, nothing major here. I think it's super, super. Can I honestly ask, have you ever truly seen Takakis in, in, in action, like anyone really using it? Truly? I have not. Um, we run Radius on on our network to do our, well, uh, maybe we do. I think we use Radius here to, to talk to into the Cisco stuff, to talk back to our, our uh, LDAP database. I mean, I've always heard about the taxes and, and I've seen yeah. all of the things it can supposedly do, and it's like, and oh, okay, we use it. It's a proprietary <laughs> thing, too. Taxes Plus is. Yeah. I know the plus size side is. That was their thing. and I think years ago, I, it was much more relevant than it is now. Um, here's some of the apps that use TCP. We did to commit those to memory. You know, Telnet, SMTP, FTP, and apps that use UDP, DHCP, DNS, for client queries, IPTV, anything that needs speed. And folks, that's it. That's Chapter 9. Almost. Any questions on transport layer? I'm going to stop the recording and y'all can ask.